remember you saying some time back you want Sanofi to be the first biopharma company powered by AI at scale. I think it's you you gave some examples of that. Tell us a bit more. You started touching on it now for patients. What would this look like if you go five years out for do, for patients and then also for HCPs, doctors, caregivers that you interact with? What's yeah. the vision? <clears throat> well, that's that's the fundamental driver, right? So we know it'll be a while before AI designs, develops, and delivers a medicine sort of standalone. But um, you know that in a phase one, so phase one, we're eight to 10 years from launch. We have a 90% probability of failure. What we think AI is going to do, at least in the medium term, is improve your probability of success. So that 90% chance of failure might become 70. You're much more efficient. So you can deploy the capital that was not at risk into doing more programs. You can, of course, be more efficient, drop it to the bottom line, but we're an R&D-led business. So uh, the the miracles happen from having a uh, stacking the cards in your favor using AI in early discovery and development so that you have a higher POS. It'll never be perfection, but you can improve your odds you know, a phase three decision could be a three, four, five hundred million decision, two, three years from launch, still with a 30% chance of failure. Still, you know, that's massive. People don't understand how it works in pharma, but we, we, we literally gamble a significant amount of money in pursuit of breakthroughs every year. It's high risk. So making that 65, 70% chance of success become 80 means that, you know, we are on the right side of winning rather than losing, and that's incredible. And then discussing, you know, all the way through to how we then communicate to patients, how we help make sure that they have the right insurance coverage, how we support people in patient access programs. You know, there are strict rules, but there's so much opportunity to support patients on that journey. Not everybody, you might, Hemant, but not everybody reads the 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 package insert in a box of medicine with its small font and everything else. And we'd rather direct people to a YouTube video with a QR code because that, that's how they digest their information outside of work. So it's really much more interesting to try and communicate to the patient in the formats of which they communicate with each other. We use TikTok, Instagram. So we, we made a decision as a leadership team almost four years ago that Every on the best day, most companies would build AI in silos, in verticals, and that our job would be to build it transversally, so that if the opportunity ever came, we would have the would be one of the few companies with a transversal data set that allowed us to go entirely along the value chain. You are working with ecosystem partners. You're working with OpenAI. You're working um, with Formation Bio. You're you're working externally and then the other thing is you're managing risk um the prob you know these are probabilistic models these are not you know necessarily predictive models or accurate models so tell us a little bit about how you're thinking differently and some of the conventions you're breaking or shifting big corporations can't rely on their internal speed to match the transformation that is happening in the world. As soon as I know a competitor has decided to build something themselves, I know that they've lost. I know that already because big companies can't attract the right engineers, the right prompt writers, the right things because they wanna be around people like them in startups, accelerators, scale-ups. They don't wanna be locked away in big pharma or anywhere, you know, trying to innovate and when a machine uh, doesn't want them to. Remember, most people fear the revolution because they think it's job losses. It's human plus AI beats human without AI every time. And the only job that gets replaced, that human, uh, human plus AI replaces, is human who refuses to use it. And so first of all, we work a lot with external partners, experts, people better than us, who move faster than us, who who have seen more than us. And then we try and create an environment where that can really take hold, where you can take the risks, you can uh, play with data, you can do things that nobody thought was possible. And and just to, to be a little bit adjacent to that, we I found a lot of resistance at the beginning because people worried about the jobs. They 
They wanted to, and the, the, somebody told me this in a meeting room once, it's better that you don't see the data at the same time as me because I need time to tell you what to think about the data. And I would much rather um, get it straight. Now I get the data the same every day, the same as everybody else. And then the last thing would be that um, the epiphany for me was the, the algorithm or the agent it simply doesn't have a career at stake. So when we're doing a phase three go, no go, hundreds of millions, we ask the agent whether we should go forward or not. And the agent will say yes or no. We can ask, and we do this at all of our development committees. The agent will say yes or no. We can ask the agent real time, can we go faster? And it will tell us the implications of that. We can ask the agent, um, can we do it for less money and what are the consequences? Can we, we can ask, can we de-risk the outcome to be more positive by investing more? And the agent will respond because it's running all of the scenarios. But it's so sobering to have an agent tell you yes or no because they've not been wedded to the project for 11 years. And so the quality of candor is exponentially different than people have experienced. I'm lucky our people rise to that, enjoy that. Um, it's just a, a conversation starter. But these are the new ways of working, right? If you reflect back over the last two, three years, what is the one thing which you feel could have gone differently, which is the one failure you look back at, at if, when it comes to AI, or maybe a challenge where you say, look, this one's been a particularly hard one to overcome or is still really a work in progress? I think I underestimated the, the resistance movement. Um, uh, back in 2021, I did go into, I used to wander around meeting rooms when I was new and knock on the door. I've had a few minutes, say, hey, how can I help? What are you doing? What are you learning? Whatever. And I walked into one and there was 32 people in the room. And I said to the guy, what are you doing? He said, we're deciding how not to give you the data. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, it's not wise you having it without us telling you what to think about it. And he said it to me with such honesty that it scared the hell out of me. Because I figured that if he's telling me that to my face, what does everybody else do? And I realized the change management, the fear is so great. And not of AI, but to any new tool, big organizations, want to slow it down to a standstill to buy time to think about how it impacts them as people i get it got to be respectful but i but i find it uh this one's so inevitable i underestimated the level of change management required. Mm -hmm.